Okay, so today I want to discuss topology, or more specifically, topological spaces. I'm not going to want to go into too much detail about most of this, as our main goal is going to be to understand something further on from topology, which is uh, manifolds, or topological manifolds. So I'm just really going to focus on what we're going to need to move on to that. And since topology is a very broad and rather abstract subject, I'm not really going to be too rigorous in proving most things, I'm just going to rely on examples and intuition. So first of all, what do we, what's, what do we mean when we say topology? Well, the main goal of topology is to classify spaces, and not just any spaces, topological spaces. So what do I mean by topological space? Well, a topological space is a set, which I'll call M for now, we know that a set by itself has basically no structure, it's just some collection of elements and all we can know is whether an element is in the set or not. So to pop topological space is a set M and then taken together with an object which we call the topology of M, together these form a topological space. So what is this object, the topology of M? So a topology, which I'm giving the symbol, I'm writing it in a set, because a topology is a collection of sets. So the topology itself is a set, but the elements of that set are more sets. And these aren't just any sets, they're particular subsets of the underlying set N. So if I now just hit you with the definition, so, to be a topology, a set must satisfy the following three uh, properties. We must have the, the entire set and the empty set are both in the topology. So the, the set itself and the empty set must be elements of this topology. So secondly, if we take any element that's in the topology, we'll call it tau. So tau is an element of the topology. If I now call these taus, I give each one of them a name with an index i. This just means there could be more than one tau. Now for any number of taus, we can then consider their intersection. And now we can't just have as many tiles as we would like, this has to be a finite number. So a finite number of intersections of topology elements, we know the topology elements are just sets, we can take their intersection. This intersection must also lie in the topology. Okay, so I'll just restate that. We take a finite number of elements which are in the topology, and we consider that intersection, this intersection, whatever it is, will just be another set. That intersection set has to also be in the topology. And then similarly, the last property, if we again consider some elements of the topology, and we consider taking their union, so we take the union of these topology elements, we're now allowed to consider a potentially infinite number of topology elements. So this could be up to an infinite number of unions. The union of these infinite number of sets must also be in the topology. So that's the definition. Any family of subsets of M, which we're calling a topology, if it satisfies these three axioms, it's a topology for the set M. So how could this possibly look? How could we construct such a set? Well, two of the easiest ones to construct. If we consider a set M, and we consider its topology to simply be, well, the, minim the most minimal topology we could construct. We know the empty set, 
uh, we know the set and the empty set have to be in the topology, so let's just consider that case. Just the set and the empty set. Well, it's obviously satisfying the first axiom. The second two are also easy to see. The set intersected with the empty set is just the set, and the same with the union, and they both lie in the topology. So this is sometimes called the chaotic topology, because it turns out to be not very useful and it's a bit of a mess. Uh, so another topology we can consider, again take the set M, now consider the topology P of M, where now this notation means the power set of M. The power set is simply defined to be the set of all possible subsets of M. So this is going to be a huge thing if M is some, say, 10 element set, the power set is going to be a massive number of all the possible subsets that we could possibly create, and the empty set. Well, obviously the set itself is in the topology, because it's included in this power set, and then you can quite easily also check that finite intersections of any possible two subsets of M is just going to be another subset of M, so it's going to lie in the topology through the fact that we've used the set of all possible subsets. So this is often called the discrete topology. And now these two topologies kind of, if you like, define the limits of where our topologies can exist. These two extreme cases, they are the extreme cases, any other topology is going to lie somewhere between these two extreme cases. So if you like, this is the smallest possible topology we could define, and then this is the largest or most extensive possible topology. So what's the point of doing all this? Why do we want to give a set a topology? Well, to really see that, we're going to have to look at a few more in-depth examples, but one of the things that a topology does for us is just give the set extra structure. A set by itself, as we said, has basically no structure, but once you give it a topology, it gets structure from the fact that it has a topology and we can only then do certain things, like defining continuity and limits. So one of the most useful topologies that we're going to need and use is the so-called standard topology. The standard topology on the set of real numbers to some dimensional power. So we understand what this set of real numbers is, it's just the Cartesian product of real lines. So we understand what the elements of this set are, they're just a list of numbers, however many real lines we've taken in the Cartesian product will have that many lists of numbers, and each of these numbers just comes from each real line and so on. So as a simple example and one that's easy to visualize, let's consider the set R2, which is just this pairs of numbers, and we like to visualize this using a plane. So we have two, two real lines that we've conveniently nailed together on their common zero point, and then any pair of numbers we think of as being represented by the coordinates, if you like. So, as a set, this R2 is just a set, it's the set of all these points in this plane. As a set by itself, it doesn't have this structure that I've kind of implied here. It's just a list of pairs of numbers, we can arbitrarily reorder these numbers and we're still going to have the same set. Just as an easy example, the set 1, 2 is completely equivalent to the set 2, 1. The set doesn't know anything about the ordering of the elements, all it knows is whether or not an element is in the set. So this set R2, the pair of real lines, we can just reorder the numbers in the line as much as we like and we'll still have the same set. However, if we now give the set R2 a topology, we will no longer be able to do this reordering. They will in general then be different topological spaces, in this case, if we arbitrarily reorder the points. 
So that was a bit of an aside. Now let's talk about the standard topology. So we construct the standard topology in uh, a few steps. So first of all, we have to define. So we define the so-called open or soft ball. This is a ball. I'll tell you what this R is in a minute. And this is a ball which we centre around a point x. And I'm going to call this x i. So what I've done is I've taken x i to be an element of R2. We can kind of intuitively visualise this as x1 coming from the first R and x2 coming from the second R. So this is the point which we're considering. It's just two particular real numbers that we've chosen, one from each set. And now we want to construct this object called the soft ball. Well, this is defined to be uh, the set of all points. So I'm going to call the points which are in the ball Y. So the set of all points Yi such that the square root of the sum. So to di digest this then, we understand this ball, this set of points Yi, intuitively it's a circle. So we view if I, for argument's sake, now just take the point at which we're constructing the ball around to be the origin, so it's just zero, then the set of all points y... Oh, I can't the wrong way around. Okay, so we're constructing the ball around the point xi. I can take this xi point to just simply be the origin, for simplicity's sake, and then we consider constructing the set of all points now y, which lie within the ball of, and now I use terminology, the radius r, which is this number which we defined here. I'll just note that r must be positive. So this y defines what we call the open ball of radius r around the point x. And now it's open in the sense that we have this less than sign rather than less than or equal to, the points which lie on the radius aren't in the ball, and not included in this definition. So we haven't got anywhere to the topology yet, we've just constructed what we mean by an open ball. Now to define the topology we say that any set U is in the standard topology. So a set U is in the standard topology if for every element in that set, if for all elements in that set, which I'll call lowercase u, there exists a ball of some positive radius around the point u, which lies entirely within the set u. Now that's a bit of a bit of a mouthful, but we can understand it intuitively. If we again take R2, and we now want to consider some open subset of R2, which I'm drawing with dotted lines. So this is a set U, and we're asking, is this set in the topology? Well, all we have to do is show that for every single point that lies in this U, we can construct a ball around that point which lies entirely within the set U. So this might be obvious, but this U now has to be an open set because if it weren't an open set and say we were including the boundary, then a point that lies on the boundary it's impossible to construct a ball of any radius which is going to lie entirely in the set. But now imagine we're zooming in on this portion of the boundary. Any ball I construct for a point that lies on the boundary 
is always going to have to extend over the boundary somehow. So our definition is not satisfied. The ball of any positive radius does not lie entirely in the set. However, if this is now an open boundary, we can approach but not entirely touch. We can get as close to it as we like. We can always construct a small enough ball such that we're lying within the set U. So this is how we define the standard topology on R2 using these open balls. And we can intuitively think of the standard topology now containing every single possible open set that we could create. And it has to be the open sets because of this um, ball construction. You can't construct a ball on the boundary which is going to lie entirely within the, the open set. <laughs>